Hello, welcome to Transmissible Briefs. Today we talk about seasonal influenza and ECDC's recent update of the risk assessment for seasonal flu in Europe. If you want to refresh your knowledge on this topic, then this podcast may be useful for you to complete. Outside of the tropics, the flu season means that anywhere between autumn and spring, influenza activity can pick up and cause yearly epidemics among the people. The influenza virus has a large collection of coats in its wardrobe from which it can choose each year what combination to wear. And each year the influenza virus tries out a coat that few people have seen, which allows the virus to spread easier without being stopped by our immune defenses. It will select a combination of H and N to wear on its world tour. And since the different coats are numbered from H1 to H18 and from N1 to N11, there can be many combinations. However, only a few are able to infect people easily. The vaccines that should protect us from becoming severely ill from flu virus need to target each specific coat. The World Health Organization coordinates surveillance networks for influenza to monitor the activity of these viruses all around the world and to advise countries how to best organize prevention and control activities to protect the population. The WHO has a global network of influenza reference laboratory that continuously monitor which codes the virus is changing, because that will determine what the vaccine should look like. In the European Union, This is one of the tasks of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, ECDC. For the current flu season, the first of their rapid risk assessments was published around Christmas. Flu activity started to show some modest increase early November, yet started to accelerate in the week before Christmas. On January 25, an updated risk assessment was published. And let's take a look at this more closely. ECDC reports on the public health experience in EU member states during the current flu season. The epidemic is in full swing across Europe, with some countries having peaked already, while others still report increasing trends. And the season is dominated so far almost exclusively by influenza A virus of the type H3N2. Most countries with high influenza activity also report a burden of severe outcomes. In the second week of this year, national reports and other data indicate unusual pressures on healthcare services in several EU countries, with severe cases admitted to intensive care units. These are mostly patients aged 65 years and older. The flu activity still increases in France, Greece, Spain, the UK and others. In France, the situation was considered critical and required an intervention at the political level and all hospitals were asked to delay non-urgent surgical procedures. In general, ECDC advises EU member states that still experience increasing flu activity to critically assess the healthcare resources necessary to provide care to influenza patients at risk and to address any gap in resources as a matter of urgency. In this figure from the ECDC risk assessment, you see the seasonal flu epidemic in Europe since 2011 in different colors. The red line represents the current season. And since we have no data beyond week two, the line ends there, but the season doesn't end there. As you can see, the season this year starts quite early. And you can also see that no matter how late or how early a season has started in the past five years, They usually only end between weeks 18 and 20, when spring has truly arrived. So we still have a long way to go. At this point, we should take a look at what is known about the chain of transmission of influenza virus. Where do they usually live and how do they move through the population? For this, imagine that the left side of the screen represents the outside world or the external environment and the right side represents our inside world, the internal environment of our bodies with organs, bloodstream and immune system. Humans are the primary reservoir for human infections with influenza. Birds and mammalian reservoirs such as swine are likely sources of new human subtypes, 
they thought to emerge through genetic reassortment, especially in areas where these reservoirs of birds, swine and humans live closely together, this reassortment can occur like putting all color of Lego blocks in one big bucket and try to see how many new combinations can occur. The mode of transmission is predominantly airborne among crowded population in enclosed spaces. An influenza virus may persist for hours, particularly in the cold and in low humidity. That means that fomites and close contacts are also effective transmission routes. Once we are in contact with the virus, then we need to depend on our immune memory and an effective response by our defense system. If we have no memory, then there is a 90% chance that contact with the virus will lead to infection. This infection can occur without any clinical symptoms. In fact, one third of the infections happen without the patient noticing it. However, they can effectively help to spread the virus further to other contacts. Two thirds of the infection will lead to symptoms of the disease. Often this is characterized by fever, headache, muscle aches, tiredness, runny nose, sore throat and cough. Most patients recover in two to seven days. Severe disease and complications can occur anytime. It is not possible to predict who will be affected, yet we know that certain risk groups are more vulnerable. And these complications may include pneumonia, bronchitis, sinus infections, ear infections or worsening chronic medical conditions. Through vaccination you may be protected. It may not protect you from getting infected but it will protect significantly against these severe outcomes. The most severe outcome of all is death which happens in general around approximately one in thousand infections. Yet unfortunately much more frequently in the vulnerable and the weak. This includes the very young. Flu complications are common in children under two years old and children younger than six months are particularly at risk. The best way to protect them is to vaccinate all household members and caregivers. Other risk groups are pregnant women, asthma patients, diabetes patients, heart disease patients, compromised immune system patients. And if people were ill or not, infections may spread to your close contacts since for up to one to five days the virus can be in the air around you when you cough or transmitted through your unwashed hands to those you care for. So what are the primary prevention methods that we do have to protect against infection with influenza virus? The most important one is vaccination. We significantly reduce the risk of severe influenza infections when we get vaccinated ourselves and additionally when the people around us are vaccinated as well. Since the flu vaccines usually offer less than 100% protection, it will definitely lower the risk of infection further if additional around us people are also vaccinated. And this is the herd immunity effect. Still, we may come in touch with flu patients and each cough and sneeze may surround us in clouds of virus. Creating barriers against the airborne transmission route will add to our protection. This could be by wearing facial masks ourselves, but also by requiring that flu patients wear facial masks or that at least they cover their mouth when they're coughing or sneezing. Even with the protective facial masks, our hands will get contaminated by touching soiled objects or snotty hands or surfaces. Washing your hands will reduce the risk of many serious infections, including influenza. Also, when using paper tissues to sneeze and cough, be sure to dispose them in a proper waste bin, since they are classic fomites that can transmit the virus. Once an influenza infection is inevitable, what secondary prevention methods to prevent further complications can we use? There is actually only one. Antivirals, such as ozotamivir or amantidine, when given within the first 36 hours after onset, we can expect a reduction of the risk of severe disease.
In general, the sooner the better, so it is important for care facilities to have it available and ready for vulnerable patients as soon as influenza starts spreading. It is important to know what type of influenza is circulating, as not all antivirals work effectively against all flu tips. ECDC continues with the following advice. Continued vaccination of risk groups will be of limited impact currently in countries that are already past their seasonal peak, as full immunity is only reached two weeks after vaccination. But it is still highly recommended to continue vaccination efforts for risk groups in all other countries that are still facing increasing trends. The current coverage of flu vaccine among risk groups in Europe is dramatically low, and ECDC urges countries to immediately start efforts to improve coverage after this current season. This is particularly important for the elderly, which means everyone of 65 years and older. For the classic risk groups that we described earlier in this podcast. For healthcare workers, since they can be an important mechanism of transmission to vulnerable risk groups. And young children. In addition, Given the current low vaccine coverage, antivirals are important to keep available for secondary prevention of severe flu out outcomes in risk groups.
Now, as we mentioned, the ECDC has developed an online course for healthcare managers called Influenza Vaccination of Healthcare Workers Can Uptake Be Improved? The course is currently closed, yet I can imagine if there is sufficient interest, they may open a next edition soon. The best thing to do, if you're interested, is to write an email to info at ecdc.europa.eu. If you want to read more on seasonal influenza, and this season in particular, here are some references that we used in this podcast. Heyman's Control of Communicable Disease Manual has a good public health perspective on influenza in general. The ECDC Rapid Risk Assessments of 26th of December and 25th of January are found online. And also, the WHO Influenza Seasonal Fact Sheet of November 2016 can be found online. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. We'll come back soon with transmissible briefs on new public health alerts.